September 21st, 1987. It's been one year since I first went inside that house. I have to finish what I started. Faith the Unholy Trinity is a survival horror game played in the style of an old-timey 8-bit video game. Initially, my only exposure to the game was Markiplier's playthrough a few years back, but after watching Wendigoon's four and a half hour long lore video, I was very interested in trying the game out for myself. And it did not disappoint. At a compelling story with great characters and amazing scares told through an unconventional medium for today's standards. But what really hooked me was the game's amazing use of body horror. Body horror will forever be one of my favorite parts of the horror genre. Watching a body twist and exist in a grotesque ways, especially while still living, gets me every time. A lot of movies and video games regularly use body horror, zombies being a perfect example of that, and it's rare to see it used effectively without it blatantly being for shock value. But it can elevate the horror of a particular scene when used correctly. Although the eerie music and desolate settings are certainly creepy on their own, Faith uses cutscenes to showcase its more horrific scenes which occasionally pop out out of nowhere. You'll be running from a silly looking white spider thing, then see it fill your entire screen with its unnatural humanoid movements in a completely different artistic style. Inside the house, we're introduced to a pivotal character for the game's story, Amy, who sent our protagonist, John, on his current path after suffering a horrible experience in this very house a year ago. She appears crawling up at the end of the bed John wakes up from, with her face missing? Wait, why is her face missing? Oh my god. Oh my god, what the f- after fending her off a few times, you watch another cutscene of a demon arm bursting out of the hole in her face. This scene alone is what inspired me to make this video, if you couldn't tell from the thumbnail. Amy writhes in pain, grasping at her face until an arm that's not hers shoots out of her then goes right back to attacking us. It seems like this one that drew many people in. And quick aside into the making of the game, Mason Smith, or Airdoff Games, is a developer of Faith and used a technique called rotoscoping to make these cutscenes. Rotoscoping is the process of manually altering film footage one frame at a time. Animators tend to use it along with live shots to make scenes feel more realistic and fluid. Mason used videos of himself acting these cutscenes out, then put them in the style of the game. It's kind of funny watching the difference in tone between a horrifying demon and Mason just kind of walking around. And while the fear factor of the main gameplay comes from the sound design and subject matter, these cutscenes are able to convey the more horrific parts that the main game's art style simply doesn't allow. Rotoscoping leaves perfect imperfections that add to the game's unsettling vibes. It flows well enough to look real and familiar, but just off enough to still feel wrong. Like a sort of uncanny valley sensation. The first chapter uses these scenes pretty sparingly, using it only for Amy's introduction and when she's going to her next phase while in the boss fight, or when you're killed by the creature outside. The second game ramps it up almost immediately, introducing us to a secondary protagonist, Father Garcia, and a sort of backstory on the white creature from the first chapter, who we come to find out was a child who was completely taken over by a demon over the course of a few months. And when he escapes, he kills and consumes someone in the apartment complex, dropping their eyeball out of his mouth with a smile on his face, and then bursts through a window leaving Garcia all by himself. And he does a funny little run, just look at it. Back to John. John goes to a cemetery to defeat the evil cult behind the demonic possessions. He defeats two demons and reads the notes attached to them, but it's the third one, the core demon, that's particularly interesting. Upon reading, we find out that this person was pregnant but unfortunately lost her child before joining or being forced into the cult. So we can only assume that this core demon attacks with some kind of weaponized umbilical cord. It's disgusting and it's great. After this, John shoves a key into his eye, and if you want the bad ending, you can use the blood spewing out of your eye to draw a pentagram outside. Not much going on inside the church other than the notes of what we can assume to be dead ghost hunters and the spindle lady. After defeating her, we can go outside to lure a ghost child to the confession booth demon if you're still adamant about getting the bad ending, you sicko. Then we head down to the basement to the sewer section of the game. We use our cross and a few skeletons on the floor for some more world building notes, but there's a room with graffiti on pillars that say, when you see it, don't move. In the next room we're approached by an armless demon with severed bloody hands covering its face. Here's another example of the art style perfectly encapsulating both fluid movements and unnatural humanoid motions as the creature creeps up on us to make sure we aren't moving. After this, we defeat a few more demons and find out that the sewer, or the candy tunnel, was home to junkies and a sort of passage for the cultists. A shootout ensued when the police connected multiple brutal crimes to the cult down here ending in a few casualties. Another note reveals that the story was all fake, and the cult had summoned some kind of creature that went on to kill others in the vicinity. John makes his way to the underground hidden sanctum to defeat this chapter's final boss, a woman known as Miriam Bell. Although less outright horrifying compared to the other creatures I've mentioned, her gaping smile is certainly off-putting. 
And with Garcia's help, unless you're me and immediately get him killed, we defeat Miriam where she transforms into a much more horrific and demonic form before disappearing. Oh, it was all a dream. Okay. Chapter 2 ramped up its usage of the cutscenes, but Chapter 3 perfected it. In all of my years of playing video games, I've been genuinely scared a handful of times. But Faith Chapter 3 had multiple instances where I had to stand up, take a breather, and check my pants. The beginning of the chapter has John visiting a clinic, which the cult used to, uh, stock up on newborn babies. John gets jumped by a demon, which he escapes by hiding from it, but eventually defeats it with the help of a cop and of course his handy dandy cross. The cop is killed by the cult off screen, and you can choose to go home, but if you return to the clinic and join the bodies inside, a door opens and one of the bodies gets up and pushes you down the stairs. The robotic text-to-speech usually works well for the game's atmosphere, 8-bit and whatnot, but sometimes it can be a little silly, just <laughs> listen. In a back room, you find an orange lady holding a baby with some candles and demonic sigils around. After talking to this woman, she reveals herself and the babies to be demons or possessed by a demon because, obviously, leading us to the first boss fight of the game. Demon babies start pouring out of the walls and molding themselves together onto this woman. This part doesn't have a cutscene, but I'm very curious to see how that would look. Something about evil babies attacking you in horror games just always gets me. <laughs> After this, John goes home and gets a note from Lisa, asking him to come to her apartment. She's a woman from his past, either his girlfriend or sister, it's not made certain, but she needs his help since the cult has set their sights on her. Father Garcia confirms that the cultists are summoning the demon Malthus there. So this leads us to my favorite section of the entire game. Once we arrive, we see that Lisa was about to send us another letter. But reading it, we can assume that this is not from Lisa, considering the change in tone and writing. Upon entering Lisa's apartment, we see our path is blocked by a seal, so we need to go around the complex doing tasks to get it open. You know, video game stuff. In order to progress, we need to let go of our cross, which up until this point has been our only form of defense. The lights go out, and we're given a camera as a temporary light source, which is when we run into a familiar face. After defeating it, we're momentarily possessed by Malthus himself. Happens very suddenly, one of the game's few quote-unquote jump scares. But after seeing this armless animalistic creature that can kill everything, John doesn't seem to be afraid or fearful. Rather, he seems disgusted by it. We end up breaking the seal to find Lisa, but we learn that she's been taken over by the demon Alu. John defeats the demon and keeps Lisa alive, at least in my run of the game. She thanks us and tells us to stop the cult from summoning Malthus. But we have another thing we can do. If we press a certain combination at the elevator and go to the 10th floor, we meet Tiffany, Lisa's supposed friend but secretly part of the cult. Without getting too in-depth with the lore, Amy from the first game was chosen to be the perfect vessel to summon the demon Malthus and bring the end of the world. Tiffany was jealous of Amy, claiming that she was the perfect vessel. She disbanded from the cult and decided to perform the ritual of the second death on herself, but she was rejected. But damn, she kinda... Oh my... Oh my god! Oh my god, what the f- Wait. Just give me a really big paper bag. Jokes aside, this was a terrifying reveal. Tiffany, despite talking to us, has a blooming onion for her head and an impossibly large demon growing out of it. Or what's left of it. The demon itself has long spider-like appendages and a large unhinged jaw with rows of sharp teeth. This here may just be my favorite scene from the entire game. There's certainly gorier and also scarier scenes, but the slow reveal of the truth alongside the fact that Tiffany is an excellent secondary antagonist ties in very well together, and the payoff was nice. After this, John drops to the 7th floor, which is inaccessible via elevator. Backtracking a bit, there's another demonic entity called the Elevator Friend. We summon him by doing another combination at the elevator, which will cause him to stalk us around the apartment complex. After we ward him off a few times, he drops a note. The notes that contain the elevator friend seem to be drawn by a child. Side note, there's another note from a woman written to a few other individuals inviting them to a Halloween party. It mentions some kind of incident that happened at the last one that left her son traumatized, but that he now has an imaginary friend and it seemed to get his spirits up. We can assume that this child was later killed by the elevator friend, as we see him get lured away, most likely as a vision and not in real time. Why am I rambling about one of the game's background stories while on the topic of body horror? Because it gets us to this room. Some kind of failed ritual, with an unknown amount of carved bodies littering the floor and stuffed onto a wheelbarrow the blood being used to draw sigils onto the floor and walls, and a figure in the middle of it all. And we get a note after exercising it. He promised me so much. I just want to see my little boy again. The replacement is almost fully formed. Just... 
a few more bodies. The mother had lost her child and was willing to do anything to get him back. Yet another scene in this game that isn't shown in a cutscene but gets his message across very clearly. John goes home once again to get some rest and prepares for the next day. On the day before the profane Sabbath, John travels to the daycare where he once stayed. He gets inside and goes deep underground, he explores the area and while doing so he's jumped by a man who injects him with a syringe, making John go a little crazy and see some vivid hallucinations. Now, he is ready. He wakes up and sees that he needs to find items to progress. More video game stuff. He's attacked by a cultist who, when removing his hood, reveals a giant meatball of a head and long arms that he uses to reach out at John. If failing to avoid it, the cultist gobbles up John and spits out his remains. John's also attacked by a giant floating meatball head and something about the sound design gave me gross chills every time. We collect the items and head outside where we're jump scared by bird after bird after bird till we find this thing. <laughs> okay, she's kinda... I already made this joke. We find another door blocked by a sigil, but by freeing multiple chained up creatures, we open it and walk in. John is surrounded by dozens of motionless cult members, all simply watching John. When we get to the end, we're greeted by Gary Miller, the cult's leader and Faith's main antagonist. He allows us to ask three questions, just a bit of explanation for lore purposes, but it's the second death that's particularly interesting. I've danced around it a bit, but here it is. Amy Martin was one of the few successful vessels the cult has ever had, along with Miriam Bell, the final boss of the second chapter. Miriam's response was a newborn Gary Miller. John would have also been a successful vessel, but there were more unsuccessful vessels, however, Tiffany being one of them. This conversation leads us to the game's final battle. We fight Gary, and Father Garcia comes to our aid. John chases after Gary while Father Garcia holds off the cult members, and John finds Gary who's now in his demonic form, and we fight him for the final time. Malthus joins the fight after doing enough damage. Both of them are gross, flesh-covered creatures coming after you. But they fall nonetheless, scurrying away, and we win. Kidding, of course. They fuse together like they're from Dragon Ball and attack John while swooping around in the air. It's a unique fight. Gary uses tons of different projectiles to attack John, but unlike before, John doesn't go down in one hit. With his faith in God completely restored, he's able to find it within himself to shrug off multiple attacks, and eventually defeat Gary and Malphus by setting himself on fire and rushing to Miriam. Malphus fades away, the corpse of Miriam Bell is burned and explodes, and Gary is left defeated. Amy enters the scene, and Gary seems to plead with her. The demon hand bursts out of her face and calls him a failure. Tentacles spew out of the face portal and drag Gary to hell. Amy allows John to finally exercise her after all these years. Amen. Faith was an amazing experience and honestly, genuinely terrifying considering the style of the game. Wendigoon labeled it as too scary for live action, and I'd have to agree, which only makes me want it even more. But thank you to Helia Soul for making today's thumbnail, their Twitter will be down in the description, and I'll see you guys next week where I'll be covering Angel Dust from Hasbun Hotel. Subscribe to see when that one's out, and I'll see you guys later.